Thank you. So we'll make a start. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar organised by CPA on the UK's transition out of the EU. My name is Kevin Minton. I'm Chief Executive of CPA. This webinar is the first in a series of webinars which we'll be organising through the winter into early spring about a range of important issues which the plant sector should be aware of or should start to plan for. This one's about EU transition. It's just about one month to go now before the end of the transition period and our formal departure from the single market and customs union. So this webinar is going to come up, cover a number of areas which uh, could be very helpful and valuable for plant hire companies, which you may need to be aware of, you may need to prepare for. That could include things like importing and exporting, EU nationals in the UK workforce, and the new UK CA conformity assessment regime. So as of today, the 19th of November, we're going to present the best information that we have, but of course there may be some changes between now and the 1st of January. Our speakers today are James Sloan, Senior Policy Advisor at CBI, Chris Castley, Policy Manager of CPA, Ian Simpson of Langside Consulting, who's Technical Consultant to CPA. As attendees, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and we'll be allowing about 20-25 minutes towards the end of the webinar for those questions. And we've had some coming by email as well. We are recording the uh, webinar, which we will schedule to last for one hour. And we will be circulating the slides with all of the links embedded to all of the registered participants. So you'll be able to click through on the links that our speakers show you on screen. The webinar will be conducted in compliance with the Competition Act and associated legislation. So participants must not raise any subject which is prohibited by the legislation. So that's all of the preambles from me. Welcome again, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. I would now like to hand over to our first speaker, James Sloan, Senior Policy Advisor at CBI. James. Great. Thanks, Kevin. And afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a big week ahead of us again in the world of Brexit, although I, I do feel a bit like a broken record after seeing this time and time again over the past few months. However, the progress on the surface looks extremely slow. Things are beginning, or at least need to, move over the next week or so if we're going to secure a deal with the EU. So to help us understand what's happening, I'm going to walk through three things, looking at the current state of play and the timelines in front of us, what that means for businesses and their preparations for the end of transition period, and how the CBI has been helping businesses um, prepare for this. So as I said, on the issues outstanding in the negotiations, the progress on the surface looks slow. Negotiations do seem to be stuck in a bit of a, a Groundhog Day situation. Those now familiar issues of fish, level playing field and state aid are still out of reach. David Frost, our chief negotiator's team, are back in Brussels for a new week of intensive talks about uh, what you might call cross-channel negotiating ping pong. Um, on his Eurostar cross, Frost put out a series of tweets reiterating that a deal must be compatible with UK sovereignty. It was a slightly different tone from Michel Barney from the EU side. He said that the EU remained determined, patient and respectful, potentially a nod to rumours that the UK could be using the tight deadline as leverage in talks. However, it's clear there is a route through on the outstanding issues and they are soluble in the time left. But with both sides insisting the other needs to move, we may need to see political leaders roll up their sleeves one final time to get the talks over the line. And it makes political sense for them to do so. It's clear that both sides want a deal, but not at any cost. For the UK, the benefits of a deal have become much clearer in number 10. Covid has undoubtedly made a big difference. Boris Johnson's first year has essentially been lost to the pandemic, and it's hard to see how a no-deal Brexit would dominate at least the very first part of 2021. We know that governments in the UK don't tend to win in the back of job losses and economic crisis, so a gradual exit from the EU rather than a dramatic one suits them. But Frost has been clear that the UK would walk away from the talks and fall back on WTO rules if necessary. This is also what you may have heard uh, referred to as an Australia-type deal. And as for the EU, a no-deal exit is the last thing you would want there as they start to grapple with the prospects of a second wave of the virus, imminent national lockdowns and other geopolitical issues. The EU's serious squeezing of timelines, which I'll discuss shortly, also demonstrate that Brussels is unwilling to be the party who walk away from the table. However, our discussions with EU member states, we've said and reiterated that the EU will not agree a deal at any cost. 
So with just six weeks left, which is what, 43, 42 days I think we've got left until uh, the UK exits the transition period, we're seeing deadlines come and go with no solution as yet. Last week, the EU in Mar uh, earmarked the informal council summit tomorrow um, as the new deadline, but there's been talk that this has already been dropped. With some even saying negotiations could be pushed back into late November or even early December. On the other hand, reports are starting to come in that if a deal is in the offing for early next week, with a meeting of EU ambassadors called for tomorrow morning, there's a possible press conference scheduled in Brussels for tomorrow afternoon. So we will, of course, be watching carefully, but we have also been here before. Timelines are tight and there really is very little room for error. Soon, though, both sides will run out of road on the time necessary to secure and ratify an agreement. So the next sort of seven days or so really do feel like the last furlong of four and a bit years of exhaustive negotiations. So is a deal within reach? Yes. Is a deal achievable? Yes. But would I put my house on it? It really would depend on the odds. So it's fair to say that the businesses are in an extremely tough position at the moment. The political and economic timetables cannot continue to compete. They must now converge. Businesses are preparing for the end of the transition, as I'm sure many of you have been as well. And they know that the issues, many of the issues that must be resolved will happen regardless of whether a deal is struck or not. Many know the changes are coming down the track and are moving to understand and implement a whole range of issues, whether that's customs declarations, relabeling, or CA, as we'll hear about later on today as well. But business resilience has been stripped bare by COVID, which has seen cash reserves disappear and stockpiles dwindle. Despite significant efforts and sums of cash, firms tell us they've gone as far as they can now to prepare for Brexit without any further clarity or guidance. So with just weeks left, for example, Retailers on both sides of the Irish Sea still don't know whether they'll be able to legally export meat, fish or dairy products into Northern Ireland. Firms still haven't seen IT systems that will help facilitate customs declarations and move goods across the border. And plans remain on hold until further clarity on a range of issues from the holding of EU customer data to complicated rules of origin. That means businesses are now making buying decisions today without knowing whether they will face tariffs and whether that would wipe out profit margins early next year. So there's a real need for, but lack of, clarity. So what have we been doing at the CBI? Well, for the remaining part of 2020, we've identified three key objectives. One is to secure an agreement between the UK and the EU. Secondly, is to reduce the cliff edge that businesses will face come what may on the 1st of January. And thirdly, it's actually help businesses prepare for the end of transition. So on the first point, the CBI have been clear, both in public and private, that a deal is the only way the government can tackle the preparation deficit. Even though many of the processes firms will need to go through in a deal will look remarkably similar to a no deal, it will help to bring clarity to the issues I've outlined previously and ensure there is a platform with the EU in which to build. Last month, we coordinated a joint statement with 71 um, associated members calling for a deal. It's a CBI record representing about 190,000 businesses uh, and that's about 7 million people across the private sector workforce. And again, we followed it up with a statement alongside our leading European sister federations calling on the Commission to find a way through too. Earlier in the week, some of you may have seen that our Acting Director General, Josh Hardy, penned an article in the Times where he urged for compromise now to give businesses the time and the certainty they need to plan as best as they can. And we will continue to keep pressure on both sides in the weeks ahead. On the second point, unlike in 2019, when both the UK and the EU brought forward a wide range of facilitations to help businesses prepare for no deal, many of these have now been withdrawn. Once the outcome of the negotiations are known, we at the CBI will move quickly to identify the key challenges for firms to get ready ahead of the 1st of January and where the gaps are that both sides need to um, address to help mitigate disruption and help businesses plan. We're also now feeding in sectorial insight directly into the Cabinet Office. So we're producing essentially a weekly heat map sent across to Michael Gove's team, which was requested directly by them. Um, and we're also now attending um, the new business, the Brexit Business Task Force even, um, which the CBI called for on a call with Boris Johnson and Michael Gove in October. So these are now weekly meetings chaired by Michael Gove, and it will give us the, the chance to highlight the challenges that businesses face and ensure that government are responding uh, to those challenges. They are sector focused, so for example, last week's were on advanced manufacturing, I believe this week's is on agri-food, so there will be different sectors focused on each week. I'm not sure if anyone here um, who's, who's listening was on that call, but it is one of the most technical, detailed um, calls we've actually been on with government. And it was a real sort of, it was quite novel that there was a real commitment from government to follow up and we'll be holding them to that too. 
So on the third and final objective, we know that waiting for an outcome of negotiations is extremely frustrating for businesses. As I said, we know that business preparations have been hampered by COVID and stalled by a lack of clarity and guidance. But there are actions that businesses can take today to help them prepare. Um, we have launched our own UK Transition Hub, which hopefully some of you have access. Um, if not, I'll make sure that you have the link to that. Let's get practical resources on there, including briefings, timelines and analysis based on the latest guidance. That's also been kept up to date um, as new information comes to light. With our sectoral heat map going into government each week um, and our engagement on the government's business preparation preparedness task force, we have some great opportunities to actually get business voices heard at the heart of government. And I'll be keen to hear actually from, from some of the people on the call how their preparations have been going and how some of the challenges uh, they're facing with that. But I will pause for there, Kevin, and hand back to you. Thanks very much, James. Very interesting to hear things from some a source so close to the Cabinet Office and the uh, Brexit Business Task Force. And if you are uh, happy to stay on for the rest of the call, I'm sure some of our uh, participants will be uh, keen to share their um, experiences with you. Thank you again. So I'll now hand over to our next speaker, Chris Castley, Policy Manager at CPA. Chris, over to you. Many thanks, Kevin. Thank you, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, everybody on the uh, on the call. Um, I think it's worth sort of stating, building really on what uh, what James uh, James said. There is um, it's there's an awful lot of information out there already for businesses. There's a lot of information which companies can can access and look at. And I think it's in, interesting in the last few weeks the government's tone around Brexit and and the advice it's been giving to um, to businesses has moved from you must get ready for this this is coming to now acknowledging the impact that covid has had and the fact that business resilience as james said has been has been limited in the extreme and uh, and has been very much sort of caught up in uh, having to to try and survive the last uh, the last few months so that's interesting how government has acknowledged that but it is worth saying there is no way politically or in any sense there's going to be an extension to uh, to negotiation process that has been completely ruled out politically. Therefore, whatever happens, change is coming on the uh, on the 31st of December when the transition period ends, and uh, we are you know out of uh, the EU mechanisms as it were. Brexit was was earlier this year. We're out of the EU mechanisms come the 1st of January. So if we can get the slideshow up, please, uh, Adam. Brilliant stuff. Okay, next slide would be great. Um, as I say, there's an awful lot of information out there already, but really the best place to go to is the government's own transition website, which you can find at www.gov.uk forward slash transition. Now that really has a, a checklist really, both for individuals and for businesses to run through information in terms of where you're situated, what areas you work in, what areas you're, you're concentrated on and how you can, how it's going to affect you, basically. The section on construction uh, can be found within there. And again, that, that goes into a little bit more detail about how construction will, will, will be affected, or certainly some of the steps businesses can, can consider and take. The government have been running a series of webinars over the last two to three months for, uh, for businesses and individuals looking at, you know, how, how different areas may well affect them. Uh, the recording of construction that was made about uh, about a month, six weeks ago or so, and it is accessible on the, uh, the transition website, where, again, it will take you through some of the various various steps. Um, but however, as, as James says, it's fundamental that uh, whatever happens, whether there's a deal, whether there isn't a deal agreed, uh, our relationship will will fundamentally change. The, the art is obviously finding out how that may well, well change. We can move to the next slide, please. For this, really for construction and plant hire sector, there are three main areas which, uh, which companies really should be considering. So uh, primarily workforce, who you employ, where they're from, and what steps companies and the individuals really should be now considering and certainly looking at to ensure that those individuals can remain within the workforce uh, after uh, come 1st of January. Construction products, 
importing and exporting. For the plant hire sector, that will primarily, of course, be uh, spare parts, machinery, uh, things coming into, uh, into the country, things that they've already ordered, future investment, that kind of thing, but also widely construction materials. We know, for instance, an awful lot of timber that comes into, uh, that, that's used in the industry comes from Scandinavia. So that, that's going to impact. Uh, and moving on into that area, supply chains, the wider impact on the construction ecosystems. It might not be yourself who's affected directly, but how is it going to affect other parts of the construction sector? What other issues do, do companies need to be aware and uh, sort of looking at now to, to understand how over the next, next few months, certainly, it may well impact on them. So we can look at the, uh, the next slide, please. So starting with, with workforce, um, EU workers in the UK before the 31st of December, um, basically they need to have the right to work in the UK. Uh, now this scheme has been running, I think for a good 18 months now, two years, but uh, EU citizens living in the EU uh, before the 31st of December next year, they have uh, this year, sorry, they have until the 30th of June next year to apply for the EU settlement scheme. And that applies really if they want to continue living and working in, uh, in the UK. Employers have been encouraged by government throughout to actually get workers to sign up to this and make sure that them and their families have, have applied to the settlement scheme uh, via a toolkit, which is uh, apparently allegedly quite easy to follow. And again, that can be found at gov.uk uh, collection scheme. Uh, employer toolkit, or we'll send the links as, as Kevin says to, uh, to everyone there. Non-EU workers in the UK uh, before 31st of December, at the moment, that, will, that remains as it was. That, 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 that system is, is in place, but this is the crucial part. Um, for EU and non-EU workers in the UK after the first of, 31st of December, uh, a new points-based system will apply. Uh, to workers from outside the uh, outside the UK. So EU, non-EU citizens wanting to work in the UK, they are required to achieve 70 points by meeting a specific set of requirements under the points-based system. The businesses that want to employ uh, these workers, and this excludes Irish citizens, and I'll go into a little bit of detail that uh, separately, they will need to get a sponsor license. Salary for these individuals must be at least £25,600 unless the, uh, the, the occupation is under the shortage occupation list or the worker has a PhD in a STEM subject, etc. Unfortunately, within construction, and this is despite extensive lobbying by ourselves, by various other uh, construction trade bodies, uh, construction trades are not included on the shortage occupation list. So uh, the Home Office has been very clear on that throughout, that they want to firstly encourage the domestic uptake and supply of, uh, of homegrown workers, as it were. And at the moment, uh, despite, say, extensive lobbying, there is very little room for manoeuvre in terms of getting construction trades added to the, uh, to the list. So until the 30th of June, if a company wants to employ an EU citizen, they will need to check that that person has the right to work in the same way as companies already do when it's a non-EU citizen. Uh, after that date, then the new immigration rules for recruiting people from outside the UK will apply, i.e. the points-based system. Now, for Irish citizens, this is separate because this comes under the agreements of the common travel area which means that basically British and Irish citizens will remain and have the right to move freely, live in, work in both countries and, and crown dependencies. So that, that doesn't change at all. However, it's moving to France, to Belgium, Germany, et cetera, and recruiting uh, workers from those countries, et cetera, the, the other EU 26, if you exclude Ireland, where the, um, where the challenge will, will come in. That's workforce. Moving on to uh, exporting and importing, if we can see the next slide, that's brilliant. Many thanks. Thank you, Adam. Um, as we've said, and, and James talked about in his, uh, his piece, as we know, trade agreements, the EU trade agreements that the, uh, the UK currently enjoys, um, they won't apply from the 1st of January. 
Uh, now, at the moment, the UK is looking to replicate the effects of these trade agreements that, uh, that we've already had as, as a member of the EU and, and under the terms of the transition deal. But fundamentally, the UK is leaving the single market. We are leaving the customs union and therefore HMRC have provided guidance and information for those construction businesses who are looking to, uh, to, to, to sort of build on this work and continue trading, importing, exporting as they, uh, as they would do. So taking exporting first, from the 1st of January, uh, the companies uh, who want to export will have to make a customs declaration when exporting goods to the EU. These rules apply uh, to exporting goods to the rest of the world, including Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, etc. Now, the process is set out on the transition website, but to break it down, companies can make declarations themselves, but this is the important part. Most businesses will normally use couriers, a freight forwarder, or a customs agent. A list of these agents can be found on the, the government's transition website. And currently, when I last looked yesterday, there are 762 of them listed in alphabetical order. If you want to export, you're going to need an economic operator registration and identification number, EORI. Uh, this will help move goods between the UK and the EU. These normally start uh, with GB followed by a number. And again, the information is there for how you apply for, for such a number. Also, a commodity code will be needed for, for products. This will identify the rate of VAT if it is applicable, if you have to pay duty on it, and if you need a license for it as well. Normally, the customs broker uh, or supplier will, will also submit a declaration to, uh, to HMRC. Um, and hauliers, freight providers, service providers, must also have the right information in order before they uh, do any border crossing. And I know a lot. there's been a lot of debate around how that will operate in Kent at the moment, given that uh, Dover obviously being the main, the main port of entry into the country for a lot of the goods that, that come into and out of, out of the UK. Um, as I say, further information can be found on exporting under the uh, gov.uk prepare to export from Great Britain from January 2021 website which breaks this down into into more detail if we can then go on to the next slide to look at um, importing now this is obviously slightly different in terms of bringing goods into the uk and one of the things the uh, the government has recognized is given the impact of the pandemic given the uh, the effects it's had on business resilience and how how companies are performing from january through to july next year the new border controls for eu goods for items coming into the UK are going to be introduced via a phased approach. Uh, that's just to give us say, a bit of leniency, a bit more uh, ability for businesses to be able to adapt and get used to the new processes for goods coming in. Companies though are still going to need an EORI number if you're importing goods. And again, these are followed by, uh, start with GB, followed by the registration number. And again, mirroring the exporting process that companies have to follow, Businesses will still need to make customs declarations when importing goods, and this will still apply to the EU as well as Switzerland, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, etc. Again, customs agents can make, uh, the companies can make these declarations themselves, but most businesses appoint a customs, a courier, a freight broker, a customs agent. The difference as well for goods coming in, uh, a new UK global tariff is going to come in and replace the EU's common external tariff. Uh, and again, this will mean that there are changes to the customs requirements and checks tariffs at UK entry ports. Now, at the moment, that is being discussed in terms of what tariff rate that would be. It doesn't apply to countries where we've already got a trade agreement. There's talk literally breaking today about us agreeing a deal with Canada, for example, and very recently we agreed a deal with Japan. But uh, at the moment, that's, I think the UK has signed a deal with something like about 20 odd countries, I think it is. Uh, and there's, there's clearly more to do in that. But uh, that global tariff rate is, is being developed as we, as we speak. Importantly, if you're going to be moving goods to Northern Ireland, then you also have to register for a trader support service. Now, that's slightly different in is to basically uh, create the borderless 
uh, issue of goods moving between Northern Ireland and, and Great Britain and then potentially across to the Republic. Um, information on that, again, can be found uh, under the importing uh, Great Britain from January 2021. And that has a separate section on the trader support services, which, uh, as I say, companies will will need to do and uh, sign up to if they are going to go to Northern Ireland. If we can go to the next slide, please. Now, I haven't included all of it on here, but again, you can access this and we can send the links out afterwards, but uh, they have produced separate flow charts for companies taking them through the import and export process, which again are on the transition website. They are literally four pages long. They are actually quite easy to follow and, and really as I say, take companies through a step-by-step -step process which show you how to uh, how to export and import and give you a checklist on things you need to consider uh, so that's that's really useful if we can have the uh, the next slide please finally really this is an issue which uh, which I think companies may well you know sort of not quite be aware of yet but something which which, which could uh, could happen. It's supply chains in wider areas, the, the construction e e ecosystem that companies are working in. It's really important, I think, that um, one of the lessons from COVID is it's shown that actually the industry can be really collaborative. It can work really well together when, when dealing with issues and sudden, sudden change. But I think it's important to really highlight the fact that um, contingency planning, risk assessment, being aware of what potential delays there might be on projects that you're hiring kit out to. You know, for example, if, if goods and build, building materials are being held up at Dover, for example, and you know, you are expected on site on one day and they're not going to be you know, delivered till till later, that may well have an impact on uh, on length of projects, obviously, but also how long pieces of kit are being hired out for. And of course, that may well impact on future future work down the line. So I think it's really important that, uh, that, that, that companies you know, communicate with each other, are open about what potential areas and issues there might be when it comes to uh, project supply chains, what, what pinch points there might be, and just be aware of really who's working on, on the projects, what issues there might be, where they might potentially crop up, and uh, and really what uh, what you can try and do to mitigate the risk. It's it's I hate to say the word it's common sense, but it's the kind of process which really, especially as we don't know what's going to happen come the first of January, it's an area which um, which really it, we do need to sort of just reinforce and re-emphasise that uh, companies need to look at. If we could look at the uh, the next slide here, please, Adam. Thank you. As I say, there is a lot of information out there. And then while the transition website is the best place for the latest information uh, and guidance, there are numerous other places that you can go to get further information. The CPA, we set up our own UK EU transition uh, page on the website, which provides a bit more information around importing and exporting and workforce. And certainly we'll get these slides added up there. As James said, the CBI transition hub, that's, that's open, I think, to all companies and they can access it and use that to find out further information and, and details, but also the Construction Leadership Council have been very vocal in some of the areas and issues that companies ought to consider. Build UK have got a Brexit hub, as have the Federation of Small Businesses, Logistics UK, which is the former uh, FTA, and the Road Haulage Association. They're being constantly updated, they're being, uh, you know, being, 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 updated on a very, very regular basis. Uh, so really just look at those sites for further information and announcements that come up. But on that note, I will now hand over back to Kevin. Thanks everybody. Very good, thanks very much, Chris. Some really helpful and useful information there. And thank you to the uh, attendees who've asked the questions about hiring equipment in and out of the EU countries. Uh, rather than just importing and exporting. So we'll save that uh, question and answer up to the Q&A sessions later, this, uh, later in, the, in the webinar. So our next speaker is Ian Simpson. Ian of Langside Consulting acts as technical consultant to CPA and Ian's going to be talking about the new conformity assessment and marketing scheme. Ian, over to you. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, as I said, Kevin said, I'm going to be talking about the new conformity assessment and marking system that's going to be cutting in at the end of this year. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, there'll basically going to be new requirements to conformity assess product and then subsequently mark the product and there's going to be two new marks there's going to be a new mark uh, for products sold in great britain great britain is uh, scotland england and wales and there's going to be a separate mark for product that's uh, sold in northern ireland uh, next slide please adam these are the two marks uk ca uk conformity assessed and uk northern ireland the two marks and you'll start to see those on products uh, from the 1st of January uh, next year. Next slide please. Right, the assessment process for both of the uh, schemes, the UKNI and the UKCA are pretty much the same and they pretty much uh, mirror the existing CE assessment process. So essentially uh, the person placing the product onto the marketplace for the first time needs to uh, assess the product against the essential health and safety requirements and these will either be in the uh, relevant um, regulation or effectively what was the directive european directive those requirements are not changing at the moment they're just largely the same so you need to go through the same process of making that assessment um, there are going to be some changes, however, to who can make the assessment, and I'll come on to those in, in, in a second. So, if we just go on to the next slide, uh, please. The UK CA system, and that applies to Great Britain, which is Scotland, England, and Wales. Uh, the, the system is due to start from the 1st of January 21, and the government is allowing a 12 month transition period, so it's going to be mandatory from the following year. So companies can self-assess their products uh, against the relevant regulations, essential health and safety requirements of each of those regulations. If it's a product which is a higher risk item and currently has to go to a notified body, it will now go to a UK approved body for assessment and then the declaration is made. And it'll be a, a UK CA declaration is made, the declaration and a UK CA mark uh, will be applied. You'll notice that it's a UK approved body. It's, you can't use a notified body if they were previously registered uh, in Europe. For the transition period, the government is allowing products to be CE marked until uh, the 31st of December 21. So effectively, there's a dual running. You can either be UK CA or CE marked uh, next year. Again, that, that process remains largely the same as it is, is at the moment. It's self-assessment or required conformity assessment, but the conformity assessment must be by an EU notified body, not a UK notified body. What you'll probably find is that the majority of existing UK notified bodies will have re-registered themselves somewhere in the European Union and they'll have a, a sister company somewhere else. And so if you've got a product that needs to go down that route, then they'll be there to help you. Uh, next slide. Rules in Northern Ireland are different and it's uh, slightly more complicated. Uh, there are two, two, two ways. You can either have a CE assessment or you can have a CE and a UKNI, it's either or. If you go the CE route, it's self-assessment of the product as it is at the moment and conformity assessment by EU notified body so it basically if something's made in europe and has been sold in europe it can come to northern ireland with that c mark on it and the c declaration the second option is to have a c and a uk ni mark and the conformity assessment has to be done where on the high risk products by a uk notified uh, body okay so there's two systems there next slide please Selling goods into the European Union. So basically, you're going to be exporting goods and sending them to Europe. Um, C declaration is going to be required for it to get across the border. And for low risk products, it's going to be self assessment or it's going to be by going to an EU notified body for the higher risk items. So if you're already declaring your product C at the moment and you're using a UK notified body, you're going to have to make sure that you go back for a type approval certificate from a 
uh, European based notified body. And then you can carry on C marking the product as you do currently. And if you're selling to the European Union, you can also have the other option of C plus UK NI. Next slide, please. There is information there, and uh, Chris has already given the, the main government um, location where guidance is, and you can go from there and find things, but there are some other places where uh, guidance is available, and I've put these up on those links. So that's all I want to say today. Thank you very much. Hand over back to uh, Kevin. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks, Ian, for taking us through uh, what seems like a very complex subject, but actually I'm expecting to be uh, not quite as fearful as we might have uh, thought. Uh, so thanks again to all of our speakers. We have had some questions come in, uh, both by email beforehand and also uh, just during the presentations earlier on. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to put two or three questions together and open it up to the panel to see if we have uh, any good information on it. Uh, and that the question is not about importing and exporting goods, but about moving goods which are continue to be owned by the hire company based in Britain uh, and hiring those goods out. So some of those goods are already out on hire in, in Amsterdam, for example, and will need to be brought back uh, some point next year. Uh, and other companies will want to hire goods out, take them out of the country to France or Germany uh, after the 1st of January and bring them back at some point in the future. Do they need uh, an EORI? Uh, because they are moving goods uh, are they and if so is that all that they need to have do they need to have uh, any further registration with uh, revenue and customs are they subject to import export duties anything like that does anybody have any uh, views or responses on that please i i believe they would yes because the the good is being being exported or in the case of if you've got something hired out uh, and you're bringing it back into the country then you are effectively, as I believe it, importing. The, the crucial thing to remember is the fact that freedom of mu movement across border has ended. Therefore, there needs to be some um, accountability. You need to show that you are bringing the new, the, the, the piece of kit, the crane or, or whatever it is, into the country from, from abroad. So I, I believe you would need to make a declaration with customs on that, or certainly at the very least, speak to a customs broker or customs agent to find out how that will will apply because obviously in cases um the, the kit might have been hired under this existing regime and system we we we're under at the moment but it's coming back in under a different regime and 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 or for a uh, system so i would at the very least speak with a customs agent to find out how that works if that if that is the case but that that as i understand the rules at the moment that is what you probably have to do, yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chris. So certainly we see that the guidance on EORIs uh, applies to organisations who move goods regardless of any change in ownership. And thanks for asking the questions. Uh, it is something which we'll get clarification on and then circulate that out to all members. Um, it's evident that more members are trading uh, with mainland Europe, or with any EU country, in fact, uh, than we had uh, anticipated. Um, James, did you have any uh, any insight or any uh, paths which we could take, do you think, to get clarification on? Uh, you... I was Sorry. going to say, I, I think Chris is probably more the expert in, in, in that specific area, so I'll leave it to Chris, and I think that's a uh, very sensible advice to, to follow right now. <laughs> okay, okay, very good, thanks. Uh, so we've had that question come in. Let me just see if any others have come in on Q&A. So uh, the, I think that addresses the three that we have, but rest assured we will follow that up in great detail and get that information back to you. Now, we've had some questions uh, which came in by email beforehand as well. One of them was about the fact that organisations which have been in the habit of bringing in equipment from the European Union are now going to be in a position where they're importing and exporting, paying VAT and duty. Uh, and the question was about the availability, the extent of the availability 
of insurance or other guarantee forms for the liabilities that they may have uh, for VAT and for, for duty. We have uh, spoken to some of our friendliest insurance brokers about this, see if we can get some more information from them about it. And we will be circulating, it, again, circulating information out to members uh, for those who uh, will find that they are now being caught by those obligations when they weren't being caught by them before. Uh, another question which has come in relating to Chris, again, part of your presentation about the, the UK construction workforce, and that is, do we have any indication from our members how much of the UK construction workforce are actually not UK nationals? How many of them are EU nationals? Is this likely to be a big issue for us or not? Do you have any information on that? It, uh, it really does depend on what part of the country, what, what, what region you're looking at. Now, on a national basis, uh, according to the Office of National Statistics, when they last sort of did any uh, large amount of research in this area, I think it's around about 8% is the figure that they quote of, uh, of EU nationals working in construction. Of course, the, the, the issue you need to then cover and appreciate is what part of construction how are you breaking it down is that breaking down from you know bricklayers is that breaking down from people operating uh, on site digging holes working machinery obviously plant operatives or does it extend up to to architects um engineers that kind of thing um so they've got a very broad definition but in theory it's about eight percent now the uk construction workforce is estimated to be about two 2.2 million uh people so you can do the mathematics on that but I think the, the really important part is when it comes down to how does that break down on a um, sort of regional basis. And it, it does vary. But for example, in London, it's about 30, 35 percent of the workforce on, in London is, is EU national. That, it, that goes up and down across the country. So it can vary between about, I think it's about 15 percent when you get into the Midlands, the East Midlands and, and upwards to about 10 percent. If you're looking at the northeast, but it does have an impact. And uh, and while the government have been sort of very keen to make sure that the EU settlement scheme, as agreed uh, and set out uh, about 18 months ago, they've been publicising it. They've been showing the steps employees and employers can take. Um, I don't know how many estimates there are at the moment about how many people have actually signed up for that. Uh, I can't. I will look into it and see what the figures are, but. You know, the government have got an estimate of how many EU citizens there are, how many are going to stay, how many are going to go. Um, and I know that the uptake initially was quite slow, but I suspect a lot of that has changed over the last uh, last year, 18 months. And um, there may well be a rush to, uh, to sort of secure the right to remain living in the uh, living in the UK and, and working here. But there is, bear in mind, that extension to June as well. So it's not a case of by the end of this year, you can either stay or you can't. It does extend to uh, to June next year, but um, but yeah, that's it. It will have an impact if if eight percent leave in that way. Okay, very good. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, so we've had another question come in, which I'm going to read live now. Let's hope it doesn't provide any uh, fear of fright for us. We supply equipment on rental to EU pro projects. And due to the technical aspect of the product, we provide initial support advice on site in reference to usage and installation. Uh, so to the person who asked that question, um, oh, right, they're currently done by a team based in the UK. Any issue relating to the, the, the professional uh, installation support and advice team? traveling backwards and forwards what are the implications for people who are at work traveling in and out of eu um well in theory freedom of movement has gone um but um it is a case of making sure of the sea it depends on really how long they are there for i would argue um it depends how long people are actually going to be working in the eu country to uh, to see um, how long they they will work in that in that uh, in that country for an extended period of time. Uh, I mean, there's there you will need things such as I believe, and James might correct me on this one, 
like international driving licenses. You might have to show that you, you have the right to actually do that because EU basis, it won't apply anymore. Yeah, I was going to say, I think there's there's expected to be clarity in terms of sort of the number of business days you can be in the yeah. EU. But I feel, I think like much for waiting on it's going to come out in detail in, in the deal. The international driving license is a very interesting point because there's still a lack of clarity over that regarding the Republic of Ireland, um, particularly if you were to hire a vehicle in Northern Ireland and then drive um, across the border into the Republic. So there is still clarity on those issues to be uh, determined. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that comment. So we've had a couple of uh, further bits of information come through on the chat. Um, with regard to the workforce, Brian Jones points out that for in some, certainly for some projects and for some particular sectors of the industry, a large part of the workforce are going to be EU nationals, not UK nationals, and therefore there might all be concentrated areas where the effective uh, right to work in the UK after the, after the middle of next year is a serious issue and so those organisations uh, need to be uh, very much uh, ready for that and make sure that the, the people who want to continue to stay and work in the UK have actually signed up to the scheme before the closing day. And Peter Brown, thanks Peter, mentions that there was a, a pre-single market for those of us who remember that far back uh, a temporary carno without the need for import and export licenses. So we'll be able to we'll, we'll follow that up and see if we can get some more information on that. Uh, and uh, another comment come in there from Nigel, which is two or three days at a time. All oh, right, how long the people are, are going to be working in the uh, EU just for two or three days at a time? So with regard to the Republic of Ireland, Will the rules with regard to movement of equipment be the same as they are for the rest of the EU? Or will the common travel area give some relaxation for the rules of hiring equipment uh, across the border into Ireland? Do we have a view on that, Chris, maybe? I believe and don't quote me on this, I believe it shouldn't be affected given the common travel area, but I would argue the very heavy caveat that may well be subject to the final final detail. We know obviously to all the CPI mem CPA members who are based in, in, in Northern Ireland, moving goods to, uh, to the Republic um, happens on a daily basis, you know, the, the border crossing, people travel to and from uh, the border for, for work. Um, so in theory, and that's why the common travel area was 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 agreed way before these discussions around transition uh, occurred, um, that, that that shouldn't be a problem. That is the, the aim. However, the detail very much depends on what is finally agreed. So, I, you know, it, uh, we can't with any certainty give any sort of answer to that other than we hope that would remain the case. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, so it's another thing for us to put on the list for clarification, I think, isn't it? Absolutely clarification. Yeah. Uh, going back to the point of uh, UK-based service teams, do they need to import and export their tools? Uh, and I guess there is going to be a threshold uh, below which uh, something you, below by, by value or by weight and size, you don't need to uh, have it registered as movement of goods and above which you do need to have it registered as movement of goods. So that's another good uh, point of uh, something that we need to provide clarification on. Yeah. So we've uh, had uh, some interesting questions there, which I think will give us a good pointer as to uh, uh, what questions we need to be asking of revenue and customs and others. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some clarification with authority on those points. Are there any other things coming in from the floor? Any other issues that are concerning plant hire companies right now about what might happen next year? Can, is it possible to get people to speak? Can you raise your hand as an attendee? I believe you can. I don't, having said that, I don't see any hands raised. I think it's worth actually, Kevin, when you're talking about importing and, and exporting, uh, getting uh, an EORI number 
the process is actually pretty, pretty simple. Uh, in fear, if you're doing it online, you can get it virtually straight away. You will be issued with the number uh, more or less straight away. The delay comes from if uh, Revenue and Customs have any queries or any issues with, with the application. That may well then delay the process and you could well be looking at maybe five, five or so working days to get a, get a number. But in theory, actually getting an EORI number it's not like you're sending it off in the post and waiting 28 days. Um, you can get one straight away. So that, that that's one you know, benefit yeah. of how the system works at the moment. Well, thanks, Chris. That's a good point. I think it's done through government gateway, isn't it? Which yeah. means that those, of, those who submit a self-assessment tax return will be used to that moment of panic on the, well, for tax returns, it would be the end of January, if I recall correctly, for... Uh, for for this, it will be the end of December. You think, oh, I've got, got 24 hours to get this done. You click online and it says, ah, oh, you need to wait 10 days to get your registration number in the post before you can go online to get it instantly. So for, if anybody does need an EORI, we understand you can get it with the government gateway, but please don't leave it till the last moment because there might be some admin processes to go through. Okay, I don't think we've got any other, no other questions have come in by email. I will just check to see if we've had any other questions come in on the chat. Okay, another question's come in. If we hire equipment from the UK to do a to job in France, but return the equipment to one of, the depot, one of their own depots in Germany. Right, and then of course there might be other sort of triangular things. Thank you for the question. Uh, we'll, we'll put that into the mix. With the other questions about uh, movement in, in theory if i can take a stab at that one but please don't quote me on it um in theory if it's moving from france to germany then it's moving within the single market and the customs union so it, it's not i don't think you would be looking at having to do border checks on a piece of kit that's already being used in france and then being used in germany he says um it's when it comes back into the UK is when you then start having the the issues. Um, so between EU countries, I don't think it's it's a problem. It's when you bring it back into the UK is when the, uh, the you have to obviously make the declaration and work with work with customs. But between single market customs union countries, it shouldn't be a problem. Oh, but, yeah, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, right, another question about exporting machinery. Currently, the person who's exporting the machinery doesn't uh, charge VAT if the customer's got a VAT number in their own country and they're using the, the uh, European Commission VIES website for that. What will be the position with regard to charging VAT on exports uh, post end of transition? I think that that's quite a technical answer. I certainly don't have any authority to give a response to that but we will find out the answer to that question and come back to you on that thank you Richard for asking that. okay so uh, any other questions from the floor right a couple more questions coming in from the floor I think we're going to put these into the question we had more questions and answers today but that's very helpful uh, Andrew currently exports equipment to the EU and also hires out to the EU. Freight Forwarder has been in contact with, has also said that they need an EORI. Yes, I think I think that's probably correct. I would I would speak with a customs broker. I would double check with with the agents that they're dealing with. But yes, I think I think that's probably uh, probably probably right. Yeah. And then another question about shipping equipment directly to Gibraltar. Well, thanks for the thank you for the question. We'll find out the answer and we'll come back on that as well. So we've actually had quite a few very helpful questions there to point to some things which people are concerned about. We can't give you the proper answers today, but rest assured we shall get the answers to those questions and circulate them to everybody. So thank you for asking those questions. Uh, that is part of our preparation of course for transition 
So go, coming back to our speakers, uh, James, at the outset of your presentation, I recall you saying you'd be interested and happy to hear people's experiences of their elements of preparation for transition. Well, we've seen some of those come through on the questions already. Does anybody have anything else that they think they'd like to put in front of James at CBI, who, as James, you explained earlier, uh, you had access to the Cabinet Office and the Brexit Business Task Force. So this is your opportunity, attendees, to get something channeled through James back to those organised, back to Cabinet Office and back to that task force. If you haven't got anything which occurs to you straight away, please email us, email any of us at CPA, and we'll make sure that gets through to James in good order. Can yes, happy. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was going to say yes. Yeah, so happy to to hear that and make sure. As I say, it's a it's a weekly thing now. We have both in sending the heat map and in actually having a conversation with Michael Gove and his team. So we are we are now at the stage of giving more, ask, um, asking more questions and, and receiving answers. But it's I think it's the more more questions we have from companies, the better. Because it shows government we've still got a lot to to answer uh, before the end of the year. Great stuff. Good. Thank you. Well, if we can't quickly get a rapid answer to these questions about import export of what might be considered import export of higher goods and VAT issues, then we'll, we'll channel, channel them through you know, straight to Mr. Gove himself, if that's okay. So uh, back to our other speakers, uh, I'll just ask if you've got any other things that you wanted to add or any other uh, pieces of information you'd like to share with the audience. Uh, Chris, was there anything else that you wanted to I think uh, I think this is a perfect example, actually, of known unknowns and unknown unknowns, as someone once uh, once said. You know, issues which we think we have an idea where it might be impacted, but it's once you actually get onto the practical reality of of, of how our industry works, how it interacts with other uh, other industries, how it moves goods to and from uh, the country across border. That that's that sort of highlights where you know there's still further information that um, that needs to be clarified and and found out. And I think this sort of highlights it absolutely perfectly. So, um, so yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, we, it's not quite the tip of the iceberg, but certainly there are, um, you know, areas and issues which, you know, we uh, we need to look at in a bit more detail and, and find out uh, what, what the situation is, as I'm sure James would, uh, James would say the same for a host of other sectors as well. Oh yeah, okay, thanks Chris. So Brian, uh, that's a good uh, suggestion actually. We're talking about potential difficulties of uh, transiting equipment which is perfectly legitimately on hire in and out of uh, the UK to other EU, to, to EU countries, not other EU countries, to EU countries. Uh, will that actually help in terms of uh, reducing the ease by which thieves can transit uh, stolen equipment? Well, we shall have to wait and see. They'll have to hide it a bit better. I think that depends on the kind of deal that, uh, sort of moving slightly out of my area here, that we agree with the European police services and identification, I, I would argue. Um, I know, again, that's sort of an area of, of debate and um, uh, areas that they're looking into, but it, it depends, again, on what final area is, is agreed. Yeah, OK, thanks, Chris. Uh, so, uh, Ian, if I could come to you or give you the opportunity, was there anything else you wanted to add or any uh, other comments to contribute at this stage? Ian, I think you're still on mute. Ian, mute. I think the new systems are going to be very bureaucratic for people on this CE marking, UK CA marking. And um, whilst I'm, I think there's going to be some flexibility with UK companies because effectively it's going to be you know, minor technical breaches if you don't get it quite right. I'm sure there'll be other people that will take delight that you haven't got quite the correct piece of paperwork when you come to export or get it across the border. And uh, people will use it as a barrier to trade. Uh, I think you're going to find that when you do hire a piece of equipment out to a company in Europe, they're going to expect to see the original CE declaration and things like that when the, the equipment is sent for hire. Even though it's not for sale, they're still going to want to see it. Yes, okay. Thank you for that. 
Okay, so we've come to the end of our hour. I'm pleased in some respects that we've got more questions than answers because it, it, it does uh, give us the opportunity to get clarity on the issues which are actually exercising your minds. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you again to our speakers, especially our guest, James Sloan, Senior Policy Advisor at CBI, Chris Castle at CPA and Ian Simpson of Langside Consulting, CPA's Technical Consultant. Uh, you can contact any of us uh, using the standard email address. So my email address, for example, is kevin.minton at cpa.uk.net or chris is chris.castle at cpa.uk.net. And we'll be happy to forward any questions on to other expert speakers. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for those questions. We shall save the questions so we know who's asked which, and so we've got accurate detail there so we can come back on it. Our next webinar is scheduled for the Thursday, the 21st of January, and we'll be about reducing emissions and our path to a zero carbon future. Uh, topical in the light of our uh, announcements in the last couple of days. Uh, that webinar will be supported by Jim Cook Groundhog. Thank you all for attending. Stay safe. I shall now draw the webinar to a close. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone.